everybody. I'm Josh Welsh, president of Film Independent, and welcome to a special edition of Film Independent Presents. We are so happy and honored today to have Brian Fogel here to talk about his new documentary, The Dissident, um, an unbelievably powerful film. Um, uh, before we get started, a couple quick thank yous. I want to thank our lead sponsor of Film Independent Presents, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. To everyone at the HFPA, thank you so much for your support. You make this year-round program possible, and we are so thankful. Uh, thanks also to our screening partner, uh, Vision Media, the platform that we use for screening films. Thank you to Vision Media. And last but not least, thanks to our media partner, the LA Times. We love you. Um, and with that, Brian, thank you so much for being here today to talk to the film independent uh, community about this incredible film. Uh, I mean, thank, thank you, Josh. Uh, right before this, uh, uh, conversation started. We were going down memory lane, as uh, yeah. As I told Josh, is when I moved here uh, in uh, it was 1997. Um, I started, uh, I guess, loitering around the film independent offices quite a bit because there was events for actors and writers, and uh, uh, and there was a library there. And then I even went to uh, going to quite a few auditions uh, at the film independent offices. So. Uh, I stretch way back with, uh, with film independence, so yeah. uh, it's an honor. Well, it's great to have you back talking um, about your film. And um, Brian, of course, is the Oscar-winning director of Icarus, um, and his follow-up film, The Dissident, is just an unbelievably powerful film about the murder of Khashoggi and the investigation into it. Um, and I mean, Brian, just to kick things off, could you talk how 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 you came to decide to make this film? How soon after the murder did you decide you wanted this to be your next film after Icarus? Well, you know, I Icarus uh, launched uh, in August of 2017. And from that period uh, through um, the Academy Awards, which was uh, uh, in March of 2018, I, I, I was trying to think about what I wanted my next project to be, but I had no bandwidth to take something wrong. And um, coming through that kind of amazing experience, um, I felt like my next project had to um, um, envelop those same themes. I, I wanted to see to it that I was going to continue on a path of doing films that I felt would have resonance, that touched on issues of freedom of press, freedom of journalism, totalitarian regimes or dictatorships trying to uh, suppress information uh, or truth, um, and uh, and and wanted to find a project that that I felt um, could have an impact that could change hearts, change minds. Um, the amazing uh, journey of Icarus is when the film came out in August 2017. Russia was still not banned from the Olympic Games. Five months later, because of the impact of Icarus. Um, uh, Russia was banned uh, from those 2018 uh, Winter Games. And so it just spoke to me of the, of the power of film and what uh, it can do for public perception. So I was, I was trying to, to find what that story was going to be and was taking my time. And in the first few weeks of October 2018, um, I think me and, and perhaps half of the world um, was spellbound and riveted and disgusting and disgusted by um, the story that was emerging of what happened to Jamal Khashoggi uh, inside, uh, you know, his own consulate, his country's consulate in Istanbul. And as I read what was coming out about Khashoggi, and there were different, you know, uh, fake news coming out. He was Muslim Brotherhood. He was a terrorist sympathizer. He was an ISIS sympathizer. He was friends with Bin Laden. Uh, you know, he deserved to die. I mean, there, these, these were coming out uh, in the media. And I, and I started to read about him as the story was unfolding. And I started reading his writings in the Washington Post. And I quickly found that this was not uh, uh, a radical. He was a moderate. Not only that, he was fluent in English. He had been educated at an American university. And, uh, and he loved his country. And what his voice was simply doing was going, 
I believe my country can be better. And I am so smothered, I can't speak. I have no voice in my country that I literally am willing to go into self-exile and leave my family to protect those values of free speech and freedom of press and freedom of opinion. And this is a man who had went through the Arab Spring. And, and as I read this, I said, wow, this, this is somebody that I would have been friends with. Mm -hmm. And as I read the story of Atija Genghis, his fiance, um, the unimaginable horror and loss of believing that the man that you love is walking into a consulate to get papers to be able to marry you, to never return again, and then learn of what had happened to him. And then, of course, Omar Abdelaziz, the young Saudi dissident from Canada, who's still living under the protection of Canada, whose brothers and friends are still in jail two years later, charged without crime, saying that because they had hacked his phone and hacked Jamal's phone, and because they were trying to bring uh, freedom of opinion through their bees army uh, to the kingdom through Twitter, Omar believed that was why Jamal had been murdered. But not only that, that the Saudis had come to Omar himself just a few months before that and tried to rendition or murder him also. And all of these elements compounded to go, wow, this sounds like a story, a journey that I should embark on. Mm -hmm. And the variable became, could I get the access? Could I get the exclusive access? Access? Could I gain the trust of Hatija, Omar, and of course the Turkish, the Turks, and the Turkish government um, to be able to craft what I saw as uh, a thriller, a cinematic thriller that just so happened to be a documentary and something that um, I felt impassioned to want to uh, want to make. Could you talk a bit more about Omar and how you connected with him? Because when when the when the murder happened, I was following it very closely in the in the in the news and the media, but I I was unaware of him. And his angle on the story and his relation to Jamal uh, and everything there was was really eye-opening to me and very interesting. You know, um, so in the days following uh, Khashoggi's murder, New York Times had published a story. And the story was about uh, that there was a young dissident uh, living in self-exile in Montreal uh, who had verifiable information that his phone had been hacked using Pegasus and that he was working with Jamal Khashoggi on this, on this plan, and that, they had, and that he believed that, you know, uh, that he was you know, one of the main reasons, uh, if not the reason why, uh, why they murdered Jamal. And uh, I didn't have any access to Omar, um, but uh, I had met Thor Halverson, uh, who started the Human Rights Foundation, that Gary Kasparov was the CEO. And right after uh, my very first trip uh, to Istanbul, and, and I went to, uh, uh, actually, I take it back, before I even went to Istanbul, um, after I had returned from meeting with the Washington Post, and this was now basically beginning of November, um, I got introduced to Thor through a mutual friend, and I told Thor I was thinking about making this film. And he goes, you know, uh, I'm, I started the Human Rights Foundation, and we started uh, we do the Oslo Freedom Forum every year in Oslo, Norway. We bring together dissidents from all over the world to speak and talk about what's going on in their country. And, you know, and our entire foundation basically, you know, serves to, uh, to push forward an agenda of human rights in, in, in regimes such as this. And in fact, Jamal Khashoggi had come to speak at the Oslo Freedom Forum in May of 2018, actually 10, and Iyad al-Baghdadi, who's in the film, uh, brought him there. And we've been in contact with Omar Abdulaziz because we invited him. Um, Do you know about this guy? And I said, well, I actually just read this story. And Thor goes, well, uh, uh, I can get you connected. And I, and I reached out to Omar. Of course, he was you know, very guarded, but because of Icarus, um, you know, he was open to the idea to meet me. Mm -hmm. And um, and I went to Montreal, this was about first week in November, 2018. I mean, literally less than a month after Jamal had been uh, murdered. And Omar and I began, uh, you know, months and months of trust building. 
And I said to Omar, I said, look, uh, and he had all this audio and all this evidence, but he wasn't ready to part, you know? And I said, if, if you'll let me just start shooting with you, because this is happening now, at the end of every one of our sessions, I will leave you with all of the camera cards. And uh, I was with my producing partner and extraordinary cinematographer, Jake Swanko, who I made Icarus with, and Jake and I, uh, was, you know, spent a week at that time shooting with Omar. And every time we'd leave him all the camera cards. And then we flew to Istanbul, spent five weeks in Istanbul building trust with Atija and the Turkish government, then back to Montreal. And we continued to shoot with Omar for another, it was, I believe, middle of May, 2019, when after a session, Omar hands Jake and I, at this time, it was like 50 camera cards, just like $50,000 with the 4K camera cards. It goes, um, all right, you're my brother. I trust you. Wow. Do what you got to do. And then, you know, he handed over all of his audio and all of the other evidence. And uh, I, I remember, I was, you know, uh, you know uh, every day shooting with him, you know, you, you didn't know whether or not to go like this or to cry. And like that scene where he's in the subway and gets a death, death threat. I mean, it, it was, that was real. And learning of his brothers being tortured. I mean, we were there as he's learning about it. I mean, it just, when yeah. you, you go through these journeys, you become so emotionally involved with these people and you want to fight for them. And that made me want to make this film. And is he, so you mentioned he's still living in Montreal and doing his work there? He, uh, he lives in Montreal. As you know, the film starts in this kind of foreign identity thriller kind of moment is where we have a drone pushing into the Queen Elizabeth Hotel in Montreal. And the first six months that I was working with him, he was living in the hotel because the Canadian intelligence had held him to go live in this hotel because they could guard him there. Um, and not in where he was living. They needed to get him out of his home. And so we would shoot with him in this hotel and on a daily basis, we never knew if we could shoot that day or not because Canada would go, hey, we just got a death threat today. Um, you need to be with us. Hey, we don't feel like it's safe. We, re we intercepted a communication. Um, he's now not living in that hotel. He's living in, a, uh, in another building, but he is still under the protection of Canada. Wow. Well, the, so the film has, as you mentioned, I mean, you got incredible access both to him, to Khashoggi's uh, fiance, to so many people involved in, in the investigation, to the Turkish police. Um, I mean, it's remarkable. I, th I think it speaks to confidence. I'm assuming this speaks to confidence people had in you because they knew your work with Icarus and you'd establish yourself in that way where people were willing to open up and, and trust you with you know, their stories. Um, but one question I have on that is how did you, with a, with a film like this and with the different types of people you're talking to, how do you, like one is getting the access and then the second piece is knowing what, knowing sort of, I don't know, your own, your level of trust with the, what people are telling you. Because for example, not to, not that I had any doubt about it, but like with the Turkish government, they have a very particular political thing going on, right? In terms of their relation to Saudi Arabia and Iran and the whole region when they opened up to you, they were in the film, they're talking so openly about details of the case. Right. And I was, I, I'd say I was wondering in that, not that I didn't believe them, but I was wondering like, why are they, why is a foreign, why is a government being so open in the context of a hard hitting documentary? And did you have any pause about that or anything? How did you evaluate your sources basically? You know, Josh, that is, that is a great question. Um, and, um, building trust with the Turks, the Turkish government, uh, was a months and months long process. And the way I looked at it was this, uh, does Turkey have its own issues involving human rights and jailing of journalists and how they handled the Gulanist coup and all these other things, you know, whatever, you know, we, we can go on about that for days. But this film, this story was not about why uh, 
is Turkey fighting for accountability? Why is Turkey seeking justice? What are Erdogan's intentions? Are they just, you know, uh, trying to get money from the Saudis? Blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, there's, we could go on with conjecture. But in this particular case, in this instance, Turkey's evidence and what they had was irrefutable. Now, the question isn't, okay, we don't know how they got that bug in the consulate, but it was in the consulate, it was in the meat room, and they had the evidence, open and closed case about what has happened. Not only that, as you see in the film, the kill team that comes, and the surveillance footage, and the security footage, and the, and the bags, and the body bag being carried into, into the consul general's office, and the oven and ordering the meat and i mean on and on and on yeah to me this was not about you know turkish politics this was about the murder of jamal khashoggi a journalist who died a horrific death in the turkish consulate and whatever turkey's intentions are or were they were and are on the right side of history on this one they are the only country that has fought relentlessly for accountability in this murder, tried to host a trial in absentia of getting any of the Saudis to come, uh, have done everything they can in this matter to bring it forward to the world. And if it wasn't for the Turks, none of us would know about what happened. So I looked at it through that prism rather than going down the rabbit hole, which you can so easily do of, well, are they the good guys or are they the bad guys? Mm -hmm. In this case, they were the good guys. And that's all that I cared about. And my word to the Turks, um, in what was months and months of trust building, um, that transcript, which is in the film, um, they have leaked, you know, some portions of it. But there's only a few people on planet Earth that had that transcript, which is this 37 page transcript. And it's me, it's British intelligence, it's French intelligence, it's US intelligence, and it's the Turks. And, uh, and they provided that to me. They gave that to me a year into making the film. Uh, the president's spokesman, Farah Tanalton, who handled their communication strategy, he's never given an interview on this matter. Farah Tanalton, uh, you know, Irfan Fidas, the chief prosecutor, never gave an interview on this. Uh, the CSI forensic examiner, Recep, never has given an interview on this nor has Abrahimi Gould, the justice minister. So this kind of access, as well as that footage and the photographs and, and what they shot at the consulate, not only is that still not released to the world, uh, Turkey uh, trusted me with that. And the, the simple deal that I made with Turkey is I said, look, you guys trust me. I promise that I am not making a film that is disparaging to Turkey. Rather, I am shedding light and truth on the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Period. Yeah. And and uh, over time, a lot of Turkish tea and coffees and Turkish delight and hundreds of hours of meetings and spending seven months of 2019 in in Istanbul, uh, even working uh, to help. Uh, plan that memorial at the end of the year because Jamal's friends desperately wanted that. Um, you know, there was a lot of trust there. And, uh, and, yeah. and, and to the Turks, uh, I'm grateful that they trusted me uh, to help them bring this story forward. And, uh, and I, I used the evidence that was given to me and that was all. And then I corroborated that through Agnes Calamar in the United Nations, through uh, cyber security examiners through, you know, intelligence sources like John Brennan, CIA, on and on. Yeah. And, um, and I think that, that uh, the story is, uh, is how it is told. I, well, the, the, yeah, it really is. And they, I have to say that, um, by the way, one thing to the audience, I forgot to say this at the top, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A uh, button down below um, and we'll, we'll get to them in a bit. Um, but I want to say the film, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's devastating and it's infuriating because you, you chronicle 
what happened and you present all that evidence in such a clear, forceful way, it tells the story. It's, it's so unambiguous what happened and, but what hasn't happened is any consequences. I mean, outside of what Turkey tried to do, the response from the international community, from the US government. I mean, you have people like Gina Haspel at the CIA, you have Republican senators and Congress people saying that the evidence is overwhelming and then the administration here does absolutely nothing. And Trump was totally upfront saying, I'm not gonna do anything to jeopardize like our financial deals. Like he was totally open about it. It was like, you know. Uh, well, not only that, uh, in Bob Woodard's book where he recorded all the conversations that came out a few months ago, Trump openly said, I saved MBS's ass. I mean, there was literally a strategy in place uh, to shift the focus onto, I think it was uh, Ivanka's emails to basically, uh, get MBS out of hot water. So not only did he save his ass, there was literally an administrative strategy trying to get the pressure off of MBS. Did you, I'm curious if you, in making the film, did you reach out to the, the current administration for comment or uh, anything from them? Did they? We, we, I went with the teacher to Washington. And as you see in the film, she meets with Pelosi, she meets with Schiff, she meets with Mark Warner. Uh, and she speaks in front of the human rights subcommittee. Um, but everybody who admonishes Trump in the film, which I was very purposeful of, because I was not trying to create a bipartisan film. I was not trying to create a Trump hit piece. That's not what I was doing at all. And so everybody who speaks poorly of Trump's decision is Lindsey Graham, it's Bob Corker, it's Rand Paul, it's his, it's his people, to basically show the bipartisan support there. And when Hatija came to Washington and she met with all these Republicans and also Democrats across the aisle, basically asking for accountability and justice for Jamal, um, she was in touch with Mike Pompeo. Uh, I was with her and uh, Trump turned down the meeting. We actually ended up staying in Washington with Hatija, basically just camped out in a hotel because we had shot what we had needed to shoot and we ended up wasting, I can't remember, five or six days, basically just in Washington with me and my crew and Atija waiting for this meeting with Trump that she had been promised mm -hmm. because she had previously been invited uh, by Pompeo to come to the White House. And then when she was there, uh, Trump declined the meeting. Wow. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, there was no reason, just like in the film, right? I didn't need to go talk to the Saudis. It would be like me interviewing Putin or Mutko for Icarus. What are they going to tell me? Yeah. Putin's right. going to tell me exactly what he said on state television. <laughs> he didn't do this. Gregory Rodchenkov is a liar and a cheat. Uh, he did this all on his own. And he is a traitor. And he's working with the CIA. And they're dug drugging him. Well, that's what he's going to tell me. Yeah. So why would I go to Russia for that? what, risk my life and go like, what am I going to learn outside of the concrete evidence, which has been forensically proven and investigated that Gregory right. Uchenkov brought forward? It was the same thing with the Saudis. So what, I was gonna go, go there and, uh, and have uh, MBS tell me, uh, I, I don't know what uh, 3 million people who work for my government do, or have some Saudi information minister go, um, yeah, we, we don't know what happened. I mean, obviously. And so there was, that's not the kind of film that I wanted to. Right. That's not the film I was crafting. I'm, I'm not making a news doc. I'm trying to make a piece of cinema that is a thriller that hopefully captures audiences and brings you to the edge of your seat. And in so doing, you care and you fall in love with these people and want to fight for them. And bringing in those voices into the film to me just felt like noise. So to picking up on that, I want to ask, I mean, the film, uh, it ends with, you have, a, you have something on, uh, on screen at the end, basically saying like, to, to, take, ac like, to take action, you know, it, it ends with kind of a call to arms for action around this case. And I'm just wondering, like, could you talk a bit more about what impact you want the film to have because it, it leaves you infuriated and galvanized and outraged by the lack of action. So how, you know, with the, with the film coming out now, 
I mean, of course you want to reach a big audience and have people, everybody see it, but like, what can, what can happen now in practical terms and how do you want the film to help drive whatever those steps could be? Yeah. I'm going to take this as a, as a two part question, uh, even though you didn't make it. So first of all, uh, we, we came out of Sundance uh, and I was beyond honored by uh, Hillary Clinton was at our premiere. We received a standing ovation. Patisha was there. Every single time Patisha came to the stage during our Sundance screenings, I mean, it was people on their feet and tears coming from their eyes because of not only the journey of this powerful woman, but not, she speaks English now. Uh, and she has to this day with her and Omar Abdulaziz, really the only two people in the world fighting for justice and accountability for Jamal. And coming through the experience of Icarus and, and uh, the reviews out of Sundance, we, we believed 100% that we would have, you know, uh, a big distributor, either, uh, you know, a major a US theatrical distributor or, you know, in my perfect world, you know, uh, uh, a big streamer. We know who those companies are, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, H a HBO, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Disney, et cetera, right? Not a single offer, not one penny. Not only that, I was ghosted. And what this tells you is that we are in a, a day and age right now where truth tellers, where people that want to tell stories like this, that want to make films like this, we are under the threat of being silenced because there was a story in the New York Times just yesterday about Tim Cook and Apple and all the CEOs of the major streaming companies, how they are personally deciding what is on their platform or not. And if they view it in conflict with their business interests, if they view it in conflict of their you know, uh, sales or marketing, that they kill these projects. And so we are in, a, in an age now of global distribution, of global business. And these companies are now only thinking globally. And this is why there's no action taken against China. This is why China can uh, imprison and torture and kill Uyghurs for their organs. And yet, you know, these companies and companies all over the world will still do business with China, right? And here's Saudi, with the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, with SoftBank, SoftBank, SoftBank being the largest hedge fund in the world, which is all Saudi money. And, and our industry having accepted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of billions of dollars of Saudi investment and Emirati investment. And what does this mean? This means that you can go behead 900 people a year you can execute Jamal Khashoggi and his consulate for fighting for freedom of speech. You can hold people like Lujan al Hatul on trial as she stands right now in Saudi Arabia and her offense with speaking against the kingdom and driving as a woman where she is sat in a torture being prison being tortured. And these major media companies and businesses will continue to do business with Saudi Arabia. And you know, not only that, Netflix just announced an eight picture deal with the Saudi production company. You know, this is the world we're living in. And we have to ask ourselves as filmmakers, as truth tellers, is this okay? At what point do we hold these companies accountable and say, yes, it's okay. We love the content that you're putting out there, but you also need to fight truth to power. Yeah. And I don't want to quote what the closing statement or quote of that New York Times article was yesterday, but it was from a major CEO of a major streaming company. And his quote was, we're not a true power company, we're an entertainment company. And I think they can be both. And, and I'm concerned for documentary filmmakers and truth tellers that want to tell stories like this, what the avenues are. On the other hand, we were acquired by Briarcliff Entertainment, Tom Wartenberg's company, mm -hmm. it's Spotlight and Crash and Fahrenheit 9-11. Um, we've managed to 
cobbled together a, a wonderful assortment of international distributors who were all going to put the film into theaters. But of course, that is, you know, <laughs> that is not happening. So we'll be uh, on video on demand on January 8th. And, and I'm hopeful that people um, will find the film. Uh, but, you know, uh, this story of Jamal's silencing um, isn't just happening in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's happening in our own country. It's happening in every country. And the business interests of these companies that basically put their pocketbook and their shareholders in front of whether or not somebody was beheaded for sending a tweet um, is a dangerous place that we, as humans uh, living on this planet, are finding ourselves in. Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to ask you that question about your distribution because it struck me as someone not in, involved in the film, but I remember after Sundance, there was so much acclaim for this film. There's so much buzz, people talking about it. And then it just went silent. And I kept wondering like, who's gonna pick it up? And obviously why aren't people picking it up? And at, you know, after Khashoggi's murder, there was at least publicly, maybe it was just PR or maybe it was real, but there was a sense of outrage in Hollywood of companies that had been starting deals with Saudi Arabia pulling back like WME, you know, divesting or pulling back. But the question is, what's going to happen now? Like one year on, two years on, how quickly are people going to go back to the trough or the table or whatever you want to call We're it? We're already back to the trough. Yeah, a hundred percent back to the trough. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, at Sundance we had a card in the film that we took out, which was, uh, it was, uh, one year after the murder, the first year of his Davos in the desert. Uh, all the CEOs boycotted, but right. they. They're second and third in line anyway, but they didn't show up. A year after, they were all there. The names, if you go do the research of who came on year two. They were all there. They were all there. Yeah. And, and, and what we see is the money and the power. It's just, it's too big to pass up. And, uh, and, and the subscriber growth in that region where you have these streamers where, where they're basically maxed out in the United States as far as subscriber growth. So they have to look, you know, at China and Saudi and Emiratis and these in Egypt and on, you know, how are they going to grow? And, uh, and that growth comes out of cost. And that cost as is uh, films like this um, are being silenced. Um, turning to questions, so we have a lot of questions from the audience. Um, there's a few different people ask a similar question, which is, um, someone, uh, Michael asked, were you ever worried about retribution? And then somebody asks about uh, Pegasus and um, were you concerned, you know, about how did you protect yourself in making the film from physical harm or from, you know, being hacked or spied upon or? Um, Look, uh, I've worked with some incredible cybersecurity experts. Uh, you see them in the film. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, I think I'm okay. Um, I just really don't put any energy into that. Yeah, because it's wasted energy. Meaning we're we're all making choices, all of us every day. And we make these choices. So if I was going to be scared, then why would I make the film? So, you know, you make these choices as you go on these journeys, like in the journey of Icarus, I was asked that question at every Q&A. And I just said, ultimately, Gregory Rachenkov's story was bigger than me. And somebody needed to help him tell it. And somebody needed to help bring the story forward, and I helped them do that. Jamal's Khashoggi story um, is so much bigger than just Jamal in one life, and it's bigger yeah. than me um, as a filmmaker. And when you meet people like Katija and Omar, you go, "Well, if, if I don't, if I don't help them with with my skills of what I've been blessed to be able to do with my life, you know, then." Then, then who will? And you can't wait for the next guy. And I, and I looked at this um, as an opportunity uh, to, to help Katija and to help Omar and hopefully help um, 
uh, you know, keep Jamal's legacy alive. And I'm honored that, that I was able uh, to do that and gain that trust to be able to craft the film. Beautiful. Um, another a question from someone named Mel, who says, this was an incredible gutsy film. Thank you, Brian. I'm curious about the sequence with the bees building their army. There are shots of many blurred faces logging into their devices to fight back. Would love to hear about your experience shooting this thread of the film. Did you have any contact with Twitter about MBS's troll army? Um, the the bees, you know, early on in, in making the film, you know, I knew obviously there was the Pegasus story. There was the bees and the flies. There was the story of the Saudi rendition team. And there was Jamal and so much of the story took place on, on Twitter, in Twitter, you know, tweets and messages. And the idea between me and my creative team, Office of Design and Development in New York that worked on our graphics and animation for Icarus, is we started going into this um, discussion of how do we create this Twitter first, not tweets on a screen, but create mm -hmm. like universe of you're in Twitter, whatever that visually may be. And the same came with the bees and the flies, which was, um, on the outset, that could be kind of a hard concept to grasp. What are, what are the bees and the flies? Well, the bees are basically Omar and Jamal and his people basically putting forward their, you know, vision or ideas of how Saudi Arabia should be. And the flies is basically the fake news and the government in like 1984 or well, you know, basically hiring thousands of people to basically quash dissent on Twitter. And so we had this idea of, you know, creating this kind of Pixar style, big CGI sequence to bring the bees and flies to life, to bring that, that Twitter, you know, battle uh, into a visual context and put that to big sound design and score, and visual effects, uh, and hopefully to convey the power of what this was. Um, and then we did that in the Pegasus sequence, that huge animated CGI world of Pegasus um, and with the rendition team. And, and so, you know, the, the graphics um, and even the entire murder with the transcript was kind of a huge, you know, graphical with light and sound and, you know, and animation uh, to basically have that feeling of like the psycho shower scene as awful as that sounds. Mm -hmm. but that you're that you're going what am i what am i watching what am i hearing what am i listening to and i think that that those cinematic tech techniques uh that you can see from so many filmmakers i admire um you know be that um paul greengrass and how he shoots verite and edits in the born films um or christopher nolan and, and inception and, and i've always told my creative team, think about Inception, you know, where I still have no idea what that movie means or what happens. All that I know is every time I see it, I go, something's going to happen. It's going to happen. And you just keep going and you keep going in the music and the music and it pushes and pushes. And so in the crafting of this film, uh, we were just so cognizant of how to take what you could have considered a new story and craft that into a, a real world thriller. And, and that was the decision of, you know, opening on Oma in that hotel room where you're going, wait, I thought this is a movie about Khashoggi. And here we are with a drone coming into this hotel room. And there's this young Saudi talking about revenge. And you're like, who is this guy? What, why is he here? Immediately planting the seed of intrigue, and mystery and suspense that hopefully captures the viewer. And in so doing, the, out, the outcome is to care and to want to take action. And that taking action, I think, is getting involved with the Human Rights Foundation, mm -hmm. hrf.org, um, whether that's through donation, volunteering, uh, signing their petitions uh, to help human rights uh, battles all over the world. It's, uh, it's doing exactly what Jamal and Omar were doing taking to Twitter, taking to social media, calling for justice and accountability uh, for, for this crime, writing to your senators and congressmen to the Biden administration and asking the Biden administration to, to look into uh, this matter and hold uh, the kingdom accountable. 
I think that's what taking action is. And lastly, it's telling your friends about this film uh, and getting other people to watch it because the more that we're educated uh, as a culture, as a people, um, I think the harder it becomes for, uh, for things like this to continue. Um, Brian, another uh, question we've got uh, from Robin Swartz asks, well, she says, thank you for your bravery in making this riveting film. Have you heard any response from Saudi Arabia or has anyone there see seen the film yet? Well, what they've been doing, interestingly enough, um, is uh, uh, if you go on our uh, IMDB page, they have been trolling it very, very well. Uh, we've got, I think, uh, about 251 reviews. Uh, I don't know who would actually give this film a one other than a Saudi troll. Uh, so they're doing that. Um, they've been trolling Omar, uh, trolling Hatija. Uh, we've uh, had people that when they've sent out a tweet about the film, you know, it gets trolled. So clearly they are uh, paying attention. Um, I've received multiple text messages for FedEx packages uh, to click to track, so I haven't been doing that. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, you know, and, and I believe that their influence and perhaps companies and PR companies, you know, they spend uh, some in the neighborhood about a billion dollars a year in global PR to basically push forward tourism and the kingdom's agendas. And, and I would imagine that part of that um, has been a soft, quiet campaign encouraging the major distributors and streamers uh, to see to it that they don't take this one. Right, right. Um, uh, David Markland writes, Pegasus sounds frightening. Besides Bezos, did you discover if any other high profile targets were compromised by it? Um, many. Uh, in the work of John, with John Relton Scott, um, it was a card that we took out post Sundance because we wanted to make film that, um, that uh, Citizen Lab has identified, I believe it's over 1,500 journalists, activists, dissidents that have been targeted with Pe Pegasus. Um, there have been many, many murders as a result of Pegasus. Uh, Mexico was using Pegasus, the government was using it against the opposition party. Uh, and was using it to track uh, journalists. Uh, the same thing happened uh, in Ghana that we're aware of. Uh, same thing in, in other African countries, uh, Emiratis, uh, Saudi that we're aware of. Um, so, you know, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a dangerous tool because Israel basically goes, okay, if you're government, we'll sell it to you. Doesn't matter if you're a good government or a bad government, We'll sell it to you because what Israel gained from that and NFO gained from that is intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. it's operating the back end of Pegasus, <laughs> NSO. So NSO knows every phone that's hacked. Wow. Every, every, so every nation state that they sell Pegasus to, they're gaining intelligence as to what is important for each one of these countries and who these countries are fighting against and where, what are their assets. So it's complicated. Yeah, I, going back to that last question, I do wanna ask, so in, so one of the, I traveled a couple of years ago, I was able to travel to Saudi Arabia and meet with filmmakers there as part of, Film Independent has a very active program supporting filmmakers across the Middle East. And one of the things that struck me there is how you can access everything in Saudi Arabia, whether you know, Netflix, the, the YouTube, it's a huge YouTube country. There's so many fil filmmakers that I met with there had seen everything very yeah. well educated in terms of cinema. And I'm wondering, is this film readily available? Will it be available there? Or, or do you expect it to be blocked? Well, it won't be on Netflix. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, what the Human Rights Foundation, uh, one of their mandates is to disseminate information. And um, while Thor Halverson is not on this call with me, um, when the interview uh, and the Sony hack happened and it was blocked in North Korea, the Human Rights Foundation made 10,000 thumb drives and literally smuggled 
those thumb drives into North Korea <laughs> and had the film translated into Korean, right? Uh, so uh, the film will make its way to Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, I am sure that uh, through, uh, through hook, crook, you know, hell, high water, uh, it, it will make its way. Yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the Saudi people deserve uh, to know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Brian, I want to thank you so much for taking time to talk with us. Um, congratulations on the film. Again, for anyone who hasn't seen it, please watch The Dissident. You will be glad you did. And um, we, at Film Independent, we will do what we can to help spread the word. Tom Ortenberg for many years was on our board of directors. I'm so happy that he's got this new company and, and saw had the, had the foresight and wisdom to, to help get this film out to the world because it's such- I am, uh, I am, I'm grateful to Tom. And uh, you know, we, had, uh, we had several scary months post Sundance where you know, we're literally going, oh my God, we, what are we going to do? We can't, nobody's going to take this film. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Tom did, and he's a, a brave fighter. And uh, we have a great uh, international sales company that, you know, we've got some great international distributors and hopefully when the COVID dust settles, uh, the film will make it its way in the world and uh, January 8th on video on demand everywhere. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Brian. Um, it's been great talking with you. Congrats on the film. And uh, when it's possible, hope to see you back in the real world. Yeah, uh, I, would, I would enjoy that. I'll come by the film independent offices for an audition. <laughs> That'd be good. Okay. Thanks so much.